similar to one I did back in November around Thanksgiving. Um, but it bears repeating, and some of the same scriptures and some of them are not. But um, I wonder if my glasses are dirty. I'm sorry if I'm a little bouncing off the walls. It's like trying to get centered down there. We need revelation from God, and he wants us to have it, right? God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. God has unmeasurable power toward us and for us. God has an, in, in, an immeasurable inheritance for us to live in and use in this life. Sometimes when we think about the inheritance we have in Christ, we're thinking about after we die and we're in heaven. But it's, it's not for later. If you have an inheritance, if you get an inheritance from somebody, you use it in this life. It doesn't do any good later on. And so that's a mindset that, that uh, needs to get shifted sometimes, is that inheritance that we have in Christ is for today. It's for today, right? It's not for the hereafter. So God's well, nature... Well, for there too, but it's mostly it's specifically for right. here. It's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm going to spend my inheritance. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> God's nature is love. He wants us to comprehend that love and to be filled up with it. That would be like being filled up with the nature of God. If we are filled up with, the, with love, then we are filled up with the nature of God because the Bible says God is love. And so the more of the nature of God we have operating in our lives, the greater understanding, comprehension, experience of the love of God we're going to have in our lives. Can't have it, can't have it any other way because God is love. Peter says in uh, 2 Peter verse 1, chapter 1, verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So according to the word here, God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these promises, we may be partakers of his divine nature. The implication is, if we are not walking in the promises of God, experiencing the promises of God, we're not operating in the divine nature. Right? The phrase knowledge of God means through the precise and correct knowledge of God. I had to look that up um, when I was studying on this here. The precise and correct knowledge of God, which I thought was interesting. So we could say to the degree that we have an imprecise knowledge of God, we will fail to be partakers of the divine nature and his exceedingly great and precious promises. Does that make any sense? If we have a if we have an incorrect understanding of God that is going to affect our ability, not God's will, but our ability to operate in his great and precious promises and in his divine nature if we have an imprecise knowledge of God. Right? So when we pray these prayers, asking God for wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him and, and asking him to fill us up with his love and give us comprehension, you know, let us comprehend the length and depth and breadth and height of the love of God so that we can really get it, so we can really get his nature, so we can really get filled up with him. Our knowledge of God will become more and more precise. Right. right. I'm having a little revelation. Can I share it? Yeah. 
I'm thinking about my understanding of God has increased to where I meditate more and more on that he's good and that his heart towards me is love and they, he has an abundance he wants to give me. So I'm receiving more because I'm believing that he wants to give it to me. So I think about the little neighbor boy next door, Josh. And if he thinks I don't like him or he thinks I'm mad at him, but I want to bless him and I want to give him love and spend time with him. But if he doesn't think I want to, then he isn't going to be able to receive that from me. Is that kind of the road you're going down with that? Also, if we are not walking in the promises and power of God and are not saturated with his agape so that it gets on everyone and is behind everything we say and do, then we have an imprecise knowledge of God. If we're not walking in what God's got for us, if we're not walking in the promises and power of God and are not saturated, filled up with his nature, fill up with his love to the point that the love of God gets on everyone and is behind everything we do and everything we say then we have an imprecise knowledge of God okay I think I beat that one to death okay. <laughs> well to say any more would be redundant but, but you know so <laughs> That's also why we need to listen for ourselves after. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yes. Be our own critic, not. Oh my yeah, there you go. We tend to be our own worst critic at times. Yeah. And That's sometimes good. we are completely blind. Yeah. To our faults. To our faults. Yeah. And think that everybody else is the problem. <laughs> if they just be like me. <laughs> <laughs> if they. They just listen to me and do what I say, everything will be all right. If they just listen to me and do what I say, everything will be beautiful. <laughs> David prays in Psalms 25, Show me your ways, O Lord. Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait, or on you I wait all the day. Which was that? Psalms 25, oh, verse 4 and 5. And as I'm reading this, I'm visualizing Jesus as he's spending time with his Father. Because Jesus had to learn. Right? Jesus had to study. Jesus had to learn who his Father was through interaction with him in prayer, and through the Word. Exactly. Right? He didn't just come out of the womb full of everything. Right. He had to learn. Right? So I can see Jesus spending time with his Father. Show me your ways. Show me your ways. Show me your ways. Right? Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Right. Teach me your ways, Lord, that I may walk in them. Second Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. But it's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this scripture, so, so what we're looking at here is God is not slack. All God's promises are yes. All God's promises are yes, and amen in, in Christ. And Peter's bringing out the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Now this, to take this scripture in Peter here, from Peter here, um, He's specifically talking about Christ's return. So we need to understand, you know, when we take something out of context, we need to understand what the context is that we're taking out of, otherwise we can end up in the ditch. But at the same time, the principle here is 
that I want to bring up is that before the promise can be fulfilled or manifested, sometimes things need to happen. Sometimes people need to get moved into positions or whatever. Sometimes the timing is right. Jesus, the promise of Christ's coming was there for a long time, but until he didn't come until the time of Christ. He's not coming again until the time of Christ. Right? So, and, and we can put that on the promises that we've received from the Lord. They're not, just because the moment I get the promise doesn't mean I'm in possession of it where I can, you know, drive that car. But it's still mine. It might take me a little while, days or weeks or years, to be able to take possession to where I can, I can drive that car, right? James says, ask and you shall receive, or Jesus says, ask and you shall receive, and James says in, in chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, in order that you may, be, may spend it on your pleasures. James doesn't say anything about faith or lack of faith here. He says it's all about motives. I don't know, maybe the Jewish Christians were embracing a prosperity gospel and asking for everything. And James says, you're asking with bad motives so you can spend on your lust. It's not that they weren't asking in faith, and that's why they weren't getting it. Their motives were lousy. Right. That's why they weren't getting what they're asking for. Sometimes the things we ask for sound good and proper and would further or be good for the kingdom of God, but really it's all about us and us looking good. Right? motive. Sometimes we don't see the things we're asking for because sometimes our motives are bad. It's so that I can look good. Even though those people are going to get blessed, it's so that I can look good. Right? John 16, 23. In that day you will ask me nothing. Assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Verse 24, until now you've asked nothing in my name, asking you will receive that your joy may be full. For assuredly, oh, in Mark 20, 11, 23. For assuredly, I say to you, whatever or whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, what things soever you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. That was Mark 11, 23-25. So we love to quote verse 23 and 24 because the promise Jesus is making. Right? Speak to this mountain and it will be removed. Ask in faith, and you'll have it. But we often don't see verse 25 quoted. And when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Now, I'm not going to get into too deep into this here, but because I don't understand the whole courts of heaven thing. You know, I know that I know that this stuff is real, but. The implication is if I'm holding something against somebody, that puts a lien. If I'm angry and bitter towards somebody, that somehow puts a lien on the answer coming to me. Sure. Yeah. Because it's an obstacle between us and God. It's an obstacle and it's an offense. Jesus says, forgive. Mm -hmm. I've forgiven you, now you forgive. Right. If I refuse to forgive, Somehow, and I can't put it all together right now, at least not off the top of my head, that puts a lien on our prayers being answered. So, is that, uh, I think it's Peter, Peter or Paul, talks about husbands and wives, you know, staying in harmony. Husbands, honor your wives. Staying in harmony so that your prayers be not hindered. Right. So that disharmony, that offense in that marriage will hinder those prayers from being answered. So keep it clean <laughs> and stay in peace.
You know, people wonder, how come, how come their prayers are getting answered all the time and mine aren't? What's going on here? Well, let's just do some self-examination sometimes. Sometimes I'm all ate up inside of bitterness and anger, frustration. Anyway, assuming everything is clean between us and God and us and other people, and we read the scripture, it's like Jesus giving us a blank check that he's already endorsed. His signature's already on it. He says, ask my name. His signature's already on it. All the resources of heaven are available to fulfill that request. You know, sometimes people will write a bad check knowing there is no money in the bank to back it up, but they write it anyway under the pretense that they have the funds. We know that happens. Maybe somebody in here has done that at one point in their life or not, or another. <laughs> sometimes we do the same thing as believers. We'll ask in Jesus' name with no real expectation that he's going to honor that request. Whether we have, whether our, we're, whether our heart is condemning us for whatever reason, and so I, I don't have the confidence towards God. We write these checks in Jesus' name with zero expectation that he's going to fulfill them, other than, or other than we're just, we're, we're putting the name of Jesus on the end of the, because we know that we're supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever things you do, whatever you do, pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. So we do it in the name of Jesus, uh, like a stamp or whatever, but not with a full expectation that the request is going to be fulfilled. So what we are doing when we do that is we are using the name of the Lord in vain. Right? Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. When I exercise the name of Jesus in prayer, or exercise the name of Jesus in declaration or whatever, I dare not be doing this in vain. I dare not be taking the name of the Lord in vain. I need to be of the mind, of the mindset that God is going to fulfill this, right? And one of the places that we get in trouble is our faith is in our faith, but our faith needs to be in God. So if we, feel, if we find ourselves trying to stir up that faith, you know, trying to believe for that thing, my faith is in my faith. My faith is not in God. My faith is not in the grace of God. Right. Does that make any sense? It takes a little while to get it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to make that shift. It, it does. It does. Years ago, I was at SRC, Seattle Revival Center, and John Keating, a, um, an evangelist from Ireland, is preaching. And, um, John was moving in signs and wonders, gifts, all kinds of really cool stuff was happening when he was preaching. And a lot of us were, we called it the river back then. You know, we called it being in the river. We were just in revival. I was, I was in revival for years, years and years. I don't know how many years. I was, I was just basically in revival. My life was in revival. I'm going to revival meetings. Stuff was happening. Anyway, John is preaching. And as he's winding down, I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, he's got a word for me. Whether he knows it or not, he's got a word for me. So I went up there and I talked to them, and I said, um, do you have a word for me? He looked at me and thought about it, he says, yeah, I do. He said, uh, the American church has a performance-oriented gospel. You're not considering the grace of God. You're not considering the blood of Jesus. your performance that you're putting
putting everything on. Your performance oriented gospel. And I'm like, well, that's really good. I need to hear that. <laughs> right? Throughout the Bible, we see that faith is the currency of heaven. Right? Faith is the currency of heaven. Not, not our perfect walk. Is, it, our perfect walk is not the currency of heaven. Our faith is the currency of heaven. The word says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, that faith works by love. Or another translation says that faith works through love. You could say that faith works through the channel of love. Faith works through the channel of love. If that's the case, then it's back to motive. If our faith in God isn't working, and if faith works through the channel of love, and my motive is haywire, then I need to fix my motive. So the, the thought is to me is not my love for God, which is true, but his love for me is why I can have faith that he'll fulfill my request because I'm confident that he loves me. And, and the grace is there's nothing, there's no obstacle from me receiving it because it's by grace completely. It's not anything I do or don't do. He just loves me and wants to do. He wants to fulfill my request. And then when I believe that and put my faith to it, then it happens. So love is, uh, right, so love is, is, uh, love is the key, really. Um, you see, over and over again, Jesus was moved with compassion, right? You can't have compassion without an abundance of love. Jesus healed the sick, he did this and that, you know, things out of compassion because of his incredible love. He didn't do it to prove he's God. He didn't do it so much to prove he's the son of God. He did say, you know, look at my work, see what I'm doing. You know, it tells you who I am. But that wasn't his motive. His motive was love. For God so loved the world that he gave. Right? It's, it's because of his great love that he sets us free. It's because of his great love that he's given us his word. It's because of his great love. It's because of his great love that he says, judge not, that you be not judged. For with what manner you judge, you shall be judged. He says that for our own good. Because when I judge, if I judge you, if I make a, a harsh estimation of you based on something you said or did, then I had better be perfect in my behavior, in my thought life. Because if I'm not, the same judgment I level towards you will come back on me. So he gives that to us for our own good. Judge not, you be not judged. For your own good, don't judge others. For your own good, don't judge others because it's coming back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on. Um, so we have to be of the mind that the word of God is settled, that it is established, that it is the standard that does not move. I and mean, so we're talking about the Word of God. And the Word of God is the Word of God. It just is the Word of God. Not what I think and not what my experiences tell me. The Word of God is the Word of God. Let's go to Psalms 119, verse 89 to 91. Psalms 119, 89 to 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled. Okay. So in Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Light hasn't ceased. Light is going, light still bees, right? God, God said, everything God said is still happening. He didn't have to repeat himself over and over and over again. His word is so. 
so we need to be of the mind that your word is settled. Doesn't matter what I think, somebody in here has, has had to change their thinking at least once. To <laughs> that's, why think, that's why it says that our mind be conformed to the word. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So God's word establishes a matter, there is no higher authority. We know that all authority, everything in heaven and earth, are subject to the name of Jesus, right? The name of Jesus is the name above every name. Psalms 138 verse 2 says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above your name. You have magnified your word above your name. So if there's anything above the name of Jesus, well, there is. It's the word of God. It's his word. It's his word. The word of God is settled forever. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. What God says settles the matter, it shall accomplish what it's set out to do. It might take a while, but it's going to accomplish what it is set out to do. Right? Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Old covenant, new covenant, same God. God has not changed. People like to say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. We're in the period of grace. God doesn't like that anymore. Yes, he is like that. <laughs> yes, he is like that. But we have an advocate with a father. Jesus Christ, who ever lives to make intercession for us. But God is the same God. Forever the word of God is settled. The word of God is the final authority, not my experiences, not what I think, not what I wish. The word of God is the final authority. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together in your name. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we commit the rest of this day into your care. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.